So uh, this is a, uh, primarily a, about a project uh, that we are doing. This is myself. Uh, I have dual role here. I'm a professor of computer science. That's my original identity. But here I'm as a uh, leader of the National Digital Library of India project, which is a project of Government of India to uh, try to democratize education. A quick words about uh, uh, India, if you are uh, not familiar, the second largest population in the world with seven largest uh, landmass. So kind of the whole population of uh, Canada is smaller than the state I live in, and the whole population of Finland is smaller than the city that I live in. So uh, India has a different dimension of uh, uh, issues to deal with. So uh, this presentation is not about uh, so much about solutions, but more about problems as we see. Uh, we have been uh, relatively new in terms of digital engagements uh, in different uh, arena. So first, the need for uh, democratization is in terms of inadequate uh, infrastructure. With, uh, we have about a million people who turn 18 every month. And uh, uh, modest estimates so show that if all of them have to be educated, then we need six universities and 270 colleges to be set up every month for a period of 20 years. So which certainly is, is impossible. Brick and mortar is impossible for a country like India. Uh, the second uh, uh, issue is we are on the verge of a, what is called the imminent demographic dividend, which means in a couple of years, we'll have the largest working age population in the world. So we need to do something about them for their employment, as well as to effectively use that uh, manpower. Uh, the third is uh, India, while uh, education and principle is uh, state funded in India, uh, education is a fundamental right as well. But uh, because of this lack of infrastructure and you know, lack of mobilization uh, by the government, uh, we have a very large uh, private education system, which is valued around $4 billion uh, every year. And, uh, but it is naturally quite expensive and not accessible to most uh, of the Indian students. So these are all different factors which uh, need democratization of education to a, to a great extent. Uh, I will not go through the details of this uh, analysis of where the gaps lie, but just to give you a quick uh, idea about uh, the structure that operates, we have primarily four stakeholders in education, central government, which is the federal government, the government of every state, we have 29 states uh, at, at present. There are several local institutions as well as private institutions. And uh, our uh, system is heavily, as I said, uh, divided between formal education system, which is governed by the ministry, and the informal education system, which is a whole lot of different coaching uh, classes, private institutions, vocational trainings, and so on. Now. Uh, I'll skip that. Uh, I'll skip these details also. Uh, let us uh, go to the project directly. So in view of this, in uh, 2015, our uh, ministry, Ministry of Human Resource Development, you can call the Ministry of Education for most other countries, uh, decided to take certain steps to make uh, education available to more uh, students, more people, by using the recent technologies that are available. And this uh, project was born and uh, the given to our institute to lead this project. So here the primary objective is to uh, integrate several sources, several institutions, uh, agencies, publishers, government bodies, so that the digital content all can be brought into one platform, not in physical copying terms, but in terms of the metadata and uh, aggregation process. And the students can get access to that. By students, again, it uh, does not necessarily mean enrolled students of schools and colleges. It is anybody from in any age group who needs to learn. And that's, so with that objective, this project uh, was uh, started. And uh, also there is objective of uh, covering or you know, uh, carrying the rich uh, culture and heritage that exists in India in terms of digital form. We have very uh, small footprint of culture and heritage in India, which goes can go out to the rest of the world. <clears throat> so in the project, uh, we have two uh, core mottos. We are naturally open. 
uh, in terms of various aspects, not only in terms of the content that we carry, we try to make them as open as possible. Not in every case so the content is free because there are uh, publisher contents as well, but about 70% uh, of the content free as well, but everything is open and uh, inclusive in every possible way. It is meant for all disciplines, all languages, all states. So I should uh, mention some of the other dimensions of uh, India. I India speaks too many languages. Uh, we have uh, about uh, uh, 122 recognized languages, of which 22 are official. That's there. That's mentioned in our constitution, which means that uh, K-12 education is provided in all of these 22 languages. So that makes it a very difficult challenge when you talk about moving into the digital uh, uh, engagement, moving into digital space, because uh, all of these languages, except for Hindi, which is uh, most widely spoken, 42% of India speaks Hindi, where some digital content exists, the remaining 21 languages has very few digital content as such. So it's not only a question of accessibility. I mean, most of uh, what we are talking of, uh, there is not even technologies available to publish in those, except for I mean, the, the, the maximum that has happened till date is the Unicode characters exist. But even there are not enough software which can create those uh, uh, documents. So but I'll just mention some of the initiatives uh, that we have been trying to take. I mean, uh, the government has been trying to take, and we have been uh, doing through this project to uh, make uh, the use, proper use of the digital engagement to try to solve some of the problems. So this necessarily the biggest uh, uh, problem is inadequate infrastructure. So uh, you supplement with the cyberspace, and there are three media which are uh, very extensively being used for education right now. Uh, so kind of I will give the uh, big picture. So on one side, uh, uh, government, uh, we have been going very strong on the MOOCs program. Uh, we, we call it uh, Swayam, this is Indian's, India's MOOCs. And uh, unlike uh, in most other uh, places where MOOCs is kind of a free learning platform, uh, but in India the MOOCs is becoming more and more, is being pushed more and more as an alternative to actual formal education. So you can uh, attend MOOCs courses and uh, take that credit back to your own transcript. You can actually uh, do that credit everywhere. And uh, there are uh, curriculum specific MOOCs programs are being launched. Swayam Prabha, the second one is, a, is actually a TV channel, a collection of 32 TV channels which run on direct to home. Uh, satellite dishes, which are very inexpensive. It is 1,500 rupees dish that you can put. And you can see 32 channels, 24 by 7, where different levels of educational programs are conducted on a, on a regular basis. And uh, uh, there is uh, credit transfers, as I mentioned, uh, already available. And uh, along with that, the National Digital Library of India has uh, been set up, which has all the contents or is, is being developed to have all the contents that the students need to uh, access, need to get educated with. And it's not limited to contents from India. It's trying to use open access uh, contents from all across the world, from big universities, big resources, and is accessible on internet and mobile. So internet, mobile, and TV. And mobile, if you are, uh, India is one of the largest uh, uh, mobile subscriber, uh, contrary to you know the general economic condition of the of the population, the penetration of the mobile uh, devices and the smart uh, devices are very very high. I mean, as we often say that in, in India, usually after uh, food and clothing, the third thing people opt for is having a smart mobile device. So that availability is very 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 strong. So uh, we are using all of these to make make up for the lack of infrastructure that otherwise exists. The second that uh, when we started the project, we started realizing is, uh, is a big uh, question of the whole education system, the institutes, the libraries, archives, all of those have been uh, trained in the you know, in a pro physical processes over last, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe 50, 100 years and more. So most of the people who control these mechanisms, control these institutions, are far removed from the digital reality of today. So, I mean, if you think about librarians in India, it's a very large librarian community, 
but uh, all of them have been trained in the traditional means only. They have very uh, little exposure to digital uh, library means and so on. So we need a whole lot of outreach programs uh, to uh, get them tuned to the way the world is moving. And uh, we have been regularly uh, doing that. We have uh, by now trained more than 1,500 librarians all across the country to mobilize and make these digital platforms usable. And because if we are integrating uh, resources from all across different institutions, the institutions themselves must have adequate uh, digital knowledge to be able to provide us with all of that. Uh, there have been a lot of challenges uh, in terms of the copyright uh, issues. We are, uh, as a country, we, have, uh, we do not have a very clear copyright policy. Our copyright rules are all based on traditional forms of resources and basically derivative of the British copyright uh, law of 1857, which got amended in 2012, but still not adequate to uh, drive through that. So digital engagements in those uh, aspects are, are very, very important. I'll talk about uh, some of the other uh, initiatives that we have been doing. We recently uh, published uh, this work in uh, JCDL uh, you know, earlier this year. This is about what uh, we call the digital surrogate. The whole idea is uh, what uh, when we try to look for a scholarly communication and find that it's published in a, uh, in a journal to which I, can, I do not have a subscription or my institution does not have a subscription, then what do I do? How do I find out an alternate? We go to Google and try to make all sorts of different searches and try to find out if there is an author archive, if there is a, there's some other legal previous version, there are uh, conference publications and so on. So uh, it occurred to us that uh, this whole process of uh, someone find, trying to find out a surrogate of the original journal paper that you wanted to access can itself be automated through a whole lot of machine learning. So we uh, created a system where once you try to search, it will give you the actual paper, the published paper, which, may not, which you may not have access to. But if you ask for surrogate, you'll be given a whole lot of options of surrogates, which are accessible freely. And uh, there's, a, there's a ranking of these surrogates that, OK, this is a, a preprint. This is a little old. This may be you know, one year older. This is acknowledged to be a you know, later version of that. So, and all of, all of that actually does not uh, need much uh, special effort, because all that it needs, Google does all the work for you. So all that you need to do is, from the original query, you need to form intelligent queries as we think of and find them. So you keep on firing those queries on Google, collect the results, and then actually compare. Because these, these are all you are talking about open content. So you can actually go through them, I mean, through your system, and compare them and do the ranking of the surrogate in this. Uh, we want to make it a part of the, the library's uh, you know, open uh, interface. And I hope everybody can uh, benefit from that. Uh, I think I'll uh, talk a little bit about the clubs. Uh, certainly, one uh, other part is uh, how do you engage all these big population of students? So we are uh, launching a big way, uh, what we call the NDLI club, which is envisaged to be a platform uh, for interaction amongst the user communities at multiple levels. So at the I mean, this is work in progress. At the finished uh, level, there's a uh, three-layered architecture where the innermost layer is the, is the digital library, all the collections and their interfaces. And on top of that, uh, there is a uh, club interface where it gives you different interaction platform and activities, like uh, some of these here. There could be different interactions in terms of creative groups, teachers, talent groups, interest groups, and so on. And at the topmost layer, a specific club can have their own website. So these, this is the, an interaction community platform through which the individuals not only can use the library, but they can author uh, uh, new content. They can recommend contents. They can uh, make derivatives of contents and share amongst themselves. And library can get enriched over a period of time. Uh, another that we are, there is, a, as I said, there's a very strong private uh, education system, and that's uh, being powered by a lot of uh, you know, digital 
uh, education companies also. Now, we are working with some of these companies and they do realize that uh, there's a need for them to contribute back to the national education system. So some of the companies are agreeing to actually come with us and create uh, platforms with a whole lot of contents like one uh, particular vertical we are working on is competitive examination. India has, because it has a, such a large population, it has a very strong competitive examination system. This one primarily on two ladders. One is competitive examination for admission to engineering studies, to medical studies, to legal studies, all different kinds of admission uh, related. And other are all placement related. The, uh, administrative services placements, banking services, railway services placements, all of these are, and, and hundreds of uh, examinations happen on a regular basis. And uh, therefore, people, students spend a whole lot of uh, money uh, in terms of getting coaching for these uh, competitive examinations. So here the whole vision is to create a, a kind of a digitally supported mentoring and coaching system which can be accessed freely by the students. And uh, well, uh, of course, peer-to-peer -peer tutoring can never be replaced by any digital system, I believe. But at least you can bring in 60 to 70% of that effect to a much larger uh, population of students. These are some of the details of that. So uh, another that uh, uh, we are trying to do is, and they have been, I mean, I was listening to earlier in the day in terms of several issues around this uh, in terms of the high you know, licensing expenses that are uh, for different uh, scholarly communication that's turning out to be a major bottleneck of institutions all across the world. So the ministry has been trying to, uh, they have created a consortium of uh, universities. There are about 1,000 universities on that consortium. So these universities are stopping to buy, subscribe to uh, journals uh, individually. They have now become one single buyer. And therefore, there's a much better uh, negotiating ability with the publishers. And what is being negotiated with that is, along with that, uh, we are trying to negotiate national licenses for many of the very commonly used contents. A national license works independent of your institutional allegiance, independent of where you are, as long as you are within the geographic expanse of India, which is identifiable by the IP address you use from the machine that you're accessing from, you should be able to use that content free. So we have been able to sign up some publishers on this uh, uh, terms. So there's a national license which the ministry pays for, and uh, the whole of the nation can benefit from that. Uh, I think there are, there are several others. Uh, one, as I said, in terms of uh, taking care of the languages. So I'll close with uh, this. So the reason I'm here is uh, to share some of these problems. And I'm certainly uh, going across the world, talking to different uh, universities and bodies. And what we need is uh, more ideas, more suggestions, and cooperation to solve this huge problem. It, it may be a problem of one nation, but I believe that this is something where solutions can be replicated to several other nations which are of, of similar nature. And uh, by sheer volume, even and this national problem is bigger than many of the international problems that we have. Thank you all very much for your attention. If there are quick questions, I can respond to that. You'll have to come to that uh, mic. I was very interested in your surrogator uh, 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 instrument, right. and and you mentioned that uh, you know. Uh, so, so as the repository movement gets bigger and bigger, as more and more people deposit their final version before it's um, you know uh, configured in the format of the uh, of the journal in which it's being published. Um, what, uh, uh, can can the author uh, um, make it easy for your surrogator to resolve or to to um, uh, to distinguish between what's what's accessible through the repository and what is actually published? Is there any yeah. any guidance about yeah. how they? Yes, could, uh, actually, actually, mark what up? what we are doing on a on a separate project, not on this one, is also to build a plagiarism checker. Uh, 
yeah. for India. Yeah. I mean, it's also becoming ex extremely expensive to subscribe to that. Now, if you think as a technological background, uh, right, these so two can... are really the same problem. Right, right. It, it is how you interpret the result which makes them right, different. Right, right. So you can say so, that. So this you is... can say that. And once, uh, uh, I mean, so far there is no involvement of the author. So mm -hmm. the, the author could actually give more better indications in terms of what is a good surrogate. At, at least till it goes to the journal, because journal is what is blocked one. Right. But till the previous ones, the, it can always be given that this is a su, su, I mean, so improved what, what, version what is of retrieved that. So what's retrieved uh, is a version where there's a marker about what's different and what's the same. And yes, no, right, right now that is uh, done by a machine learning mm -hmm. process. It tries to analyze a couple of versions and tries to rank them in terms of their dating. Okay. Which microphone? So, so one thing that strikes me, um, I don't know if you're aware of the work that Jason Prem and Heather Pivovar have done with Unpaywall, um, but that's a tool chain that allows you to discover from a scholarly work whether there are open access copies available. And they're here. I mean, so they're... Um, but they're also working on um, an Arcadia-funded project um, to try and build uh, summaries of that content through machine learning. So it just struck me there was a, a series of things there that would be worth um, following up on. Um, I'm really struck by your comments about language um, and scripts. So in some of our work, we've started trying to tackle some questions that relate to uh, metadata in Cyrillic and um, traditional and modern or simplified Chinese. Um, but we haven't even started thinking about scripts from other scripts from Southeast Asia. Is the situation completely basic? Is there, are there areas where there is useful work being done? Um, no, there, is there is a, there's a lot of effort, uh, particularly uh, the, the problem is in uh, not only there are so many languages, but uh, there is uh, a great vari variation in terms of scripts. See, one of the easiest way to handle this is to have an OCR, which may not do a complete uh, digital uh, uh, conversion, but may give you a searchable PDF kind of, which can greatly enhance the value of metadata. Currently, in our uh, collection, there's a huge, I mean, relatively huge volume of Indian content, but all of their metadata is in English. So the, which makes it practically unusable, even when I am providing an interface which is in Hindi or interfaces in Gujarati. But the metadata has to be written in English. Because I have not been able to extract that metadata from the content, because the content was a scanned document. So in terms of that, uh, at least in uh, uh, we have major two. One is an Indic group of languages, which is derivative of Sanskrit. Uh, one are uh, Asian. Persian languages, Arabic, Urdu, those kind of, and one are Dravidian languages. So of that uh, Hindi and the four, there are four Dravidian languages, the OCRs are at a pretty advanced stage. So we are hoping that in another year or so, there are two institutions who are, who are particularly working on that. In another uh, two years, one or two years, we'll have at least five languages where there will be a searchable uh, OCR. Uh, by the way, Google's uh, version of OCR in all of these languages are pathetic. So, and, and Google knows that. I, 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 I met the project director and we discussed and he, he is upset. So, so. Okay. Just yes. Curious, I mean, there's a lot of shared languages between Pakistan and India. Right. And, you know, um, is there any uh, opportunity to collaborate, especially in the digital space? Uh, I mean, this is, um, I don't know how to react to that. Uh, uh, if I, if I, for this, if I travel to Pakistan, I'm not sure whether I'll be able to allowed to enter USA. Yeah. That's that's the kind of, you know, uh, kind of reality that uh, we Indians and our counterparts have been able to give to ourselves. So we, I collaborate currently with all SARC countries, but except the country which could have contributed the maximum. This is such a political situation that uh, academicians cannot address. That, that's that. At a national library level, would there be any other? No, it's too political. 
we had an international workshop last year, and there were two delegates from Pakistan. My external affairs ministry did not give them clearance to come to us. I mean, we, we, both countries are so hypertensed with issues that just do not exist that it's no point discussing that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you.